beginning, but from, from where I usually leave off and start talking about the advanced stages. Uh, and I am right now thinking, I don't see any names here of people who have ever seen me present before. Hold on so uh, one second. Uh, before you get started in earnest, Jose. Uh, I'm I, not him. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I just need to tell the audience that we are recording this session. And so if you um, would not like your face or your name to appear in the recording, go ahead and in the uh, settings on, in the participants section, uh, change your, your screen name. All right, thanks. Okay, I'm ready anytime you want, Wendy. Okay, yep, go ahead, thank you. Alrighty, um, I am still trying to make up my mind about whether or not I should uh, uh, re immediately rejig what I'm planning to do uh, for this uh, presentation, because um, if some of you read the abstract, uh, the abstract said that I would be talking about fluency and the method that I use from an intermediate standpoint. I have been talking about my method for quite a while, and uh, I get a lot of requests asking, wow, that's really interesting, but how do you actually take it all the way to the end of the semester? What other exercises do you do? What other goals do you have besides establishing the primary um, uh, uh, basis for the kids to be able to do their fluency exercises. And that's what I wanted to do today, but I'm looking through this list right now and I see absolutely no one who has actually seen my uh, presentation before. So uh, I'm going to go with my original plan, which is that uh, I, I was planning that there was going to be a bunch of people here who had seen me teach before, or present before, maybe three or four people who had but I'm going to go with my original plan and my original warning. I'm gonna be talking about this from an intermediate stage, although I, I put in a couple of extra slides that might help people understand what I'm doing. But if you want to actually see the original presentations from which I base this, if you look at the sessions ELL page and you will find my uh, abstract, my video abstract there, plus my assets PDF, if you download that assets PDF, you will see a link for my website where you can see all of my prior presentations in the past, plus uh, the, the many that I did this year that will tell you what I base this presentation on. Then you can revisit this presentation at its recording and um, go from there. But I've also made it so that then you can see a little bit about what I'm talking about, okay? So um, by the way, I haven't introduced myself. My name is Jose Domingo Cruz. I am an adjunct uh, instructor at Kitakyushu University. I've been in Japan since 1991. I've been teaching at university since about 1996, 1997. So I've been at this a little while. I have a particular method called verbal classrooms that I will be talking about today. And, uh, and I think I'm gonna start my slideshow for that right now. Okay, uh, verbal classrooms, faster, smoother, more. Uh, the uh, whole subtitle, Faster, Smoother, More, refers to the idea that that's what we want our students to be able to do. Most of us, even in four skills classes or people who uh, do communication classes, uh, are, are probably, you know, we have a common sort of, I don't say problem or a worry, but we have a common hurdle that we have in our classrooms. Our kids themselves, probably even the ones who don't want to speak or, or the ones that, uh, that do want to speak, all have bad fluency levels. And fluency itself is, is an important aspect of what we eventually want these kids to achieve. But how do you get them to, to do that? What are the methods to do that? We all talk about it, but even fluency itself is very poorly defined. Hey, Domingo Cruz. Um, is very poorly defined. You actually put the video on in the assets. Oh, okay, uh, Wendy, I think your mic is on. I think you got a hot mic. Um, can everybody please turn off their mics? Or somebody's got a hot mic. Okay, so uh, I didn't plan on showing the next couple of slides, but uh, here they are. And they're videos of me uh, from a demonstration class that I did, I had been doing some research work with a professor here in Kitakyushu at a national university. His name is Robert William Long. And he asked me to do a demonstration class on my methods uh, because his 
research area is fluency. And my method was the one system that he felt actually led to higher fluency practice and higher fluency production from kids. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about this because I got a whole bunch of slides that talks after this, but I want you to see generally what I do in a classroom. This um, video, it plays for about two and a half minutes and shows the very, very basic first exercise that I do with kids to get them to start producing with each other in a large classroom from the very, very basic parts of English. You see there behind me a set of pronouns and the conjugation with the be verb in the present tense. And I'm going to be using that and explaining that to this bunch of kids who uh, signed um, model releases. But and so they knew that they were going to be recorded, but they had no idea what I was going to be doing. So their, um, their uh, reactions are very natural. Uh, they don't know uh, this, uh, this uh, method. And uh, this uh, will tell you what it's like actually in the classrooms. So let's watch that for a bit. My teacher wrote this up for me. Oh gosh, no, what is that? That's uh, 46 years ago? Holy cow. Okay, uh, when I first went to Canada. And, and one day she said, Jose, stand up, say all of this in a big, loud, fast voice. And I would stand up and I would say, I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. Very good, two times, faster, louder. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. I am, you are, he is, she is, it is, we are, they are. <laughs> now, I bet if I asked one of you right now to do that, you couldn't. And you are university students who've studied English for six years. Just goes to show you, all the studying you do doesn't get you ready for speaking. So we're gonna speak today. First thing we're gonna do, I want you to turn around in your chairs 90 degrees, turn around 90 degrees, turn around and face your partner on that side. Just no, turn around in your chair, yeah, just turn around in your chair. You don't have to turn the chair, just turn around in your chair. Good, okay, there you go, good, okay. And this is what we're gonna do. I'm going to show you how to do this with you, okay. Take it from the first line, somebody, when I say ready, go, first line, Okay. You will, I, I'll go with I am, you'll begin with you are, and I'll continue with he is, she is, and we'll continue from there. When we get to the bottom, we go back to the top. Ready? I'll start. I am. Uh, he, love. he is. She is. It is. Look at me. Look they, at me. Are. they are. I am. You are. He is. She is. It is. We are. They are. I am. You he are, is. She, it is. We are. Over here, over here, over here. <laughs> Very difficult, yeah? Yes. But it looks so easy, yeah? Because yeah. looking at something in English, studying it on paper is nowhere near as difficult as looking at somebody in the eyes. So it's okay. If you want to look at this, go ahead. Take a look. You can check the order. You can check whatever it is you want. But when you speak to a person, learn to go from paper to a person's eyes. Look all you want, but when your mouth moves, you go back to the person. Okay, when I say ready, go, somebody begins. Look at your partners. Ready, go. Sorry about that. Um, that was the very, very first exercise that I do in something called verbal classrooms. The indicators that you see down here on the bottom right-hand side, the date are all wrong because I had to suddenly drag these from a prior presentation to this presentation. Don't worry, I know that it's 2021. And um, it is the reaction that I always get from my students. When I say, ready, go, they go. I know that it's hard to believe, but they then take that behavior for every single practice, every single drill that I present in front of them to the point where when we get to the end of the classroom, they are having independent conversations and they look like this. They are animated, they are not using notes, they are not reading from a script, they are not spewing a speech that they memorized with dead shark eyes. They are talking to each other in their best English and it's full of mistakes, 
but it hits the targets of fluency. The targets of fluency that I promote to them, which unfortunately I don't have a slide for, but basically is to try to speak at least or to target uh, 80 words per minute. Uh, any of you who actually do fluency research uh, will probably um, recognize that I'm using a measure that is not normal. Most fluency researchers do their, uh, their measurements in syllables uh, in speaking rate A versus speaking rate, B, speaking rate B, which is fine for research. But in terms of actually getting your kids to understand what is necessary for their fluency, words per minute is far simpler. It's actually useful in the classroom. It can be used as a measuring tool uh, and, um, and is something that uh, for normal people is, is uh, more understandable. The other aspect of fluency that's important I wanted to talk about today is your smoothness, your ability to speak smoothly and that is something that I don't get a chance to talk about very much. So I'm gonna start talking about it now. But try to remember the, the slide that I showed before with the one boy who was just going, I am, you are, he is, she is with me, okay? Now, if I recall, I don't think I can see anyone uh, in the participants list who might be able to actually help me uh, do this uh, as a demonstration. So bear with me. I thought I might have at least one, but I don't. So I'm gonna to have to do these. Um, uh, demonstrations by myself. So on the left-hand side, you're going to see that same list of pronouns and the B verb. Uh, and uh, the right-hand side is the matching subject verb question. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, subject verb inverted to verb subject so that it shows that uh, in English, our basic grammatical system for making a question just reverses the order of the subject verb to the verb subject. The kids in your university classes, if you're teaching university like me, will already know that. And they, some of them might be rolling their eyes going, oh my God, are we stepping back that far? Uh, but then you tell them, yes, but how quickly can you say it? And what I asked them to do after we've done a lot of exercises, which unfortunately I'm not going to be showing to you, but is in my other presentations, okay? This exercise would probably be shown to the students by around week three, week four, after we've done a lot of variations on I am, you are, he is. The variations would be different verbs, I do, you do, he does, the negative forms, the past forms. Then we go on to this very difficult form, which is the question, okay? Now, in this case, what I asked them to do is to follow that yellow line. Now, the first person will begin with I am, as they always have, according to that practice that you saw me do before. But this time, the person who speaks has to answer, has to sort of uh, give an utterance composed of both an answer and a question. And the question will use a different subject than the answer. The answer, if it is I am, will use the subject that follows next in order. So if the subject was I, the question subject will be you. Gives them a little bit more of a cognitive load and doesn't make it so, so, so robot-like, it actually starts becoming somewhat conversational when you get down past I am and you are. So you follow that yellow line and that becomes the first utterance. The first person's utterance will be I am, are you? The rule will then follow that the person taking the next term will use the questions subject to create the answer. Thus the next yellow line begins at you are. Following the same rule, it uses the next subject, he, and becomes you are, is he. He was the question subject, so the answer will use the same subject. He is, is she. And it would continue like this. So let me take it from the top with my imaginary friend here. Don't worry, I don't talk to my imaginary friend that often. And I will say to him, I am, are you? You are, is he? He is, is she? She is, is it? It is, are we? We are, are they, they are, am I, back up to the top. I am, are you, you are, is he, he is, is she, she is, is it, it is, are we, we are, are they, they are, am I. And until they can get to that kind of speed, I think this is a perfectly fine practice. Now you're probably thinking, won't they get bored? No, they don't get bored. They don't get bored because did you see how I set them up in pairs? We switch those pairs. And again, uh, I don't show uh, in this presentation how to switch those pairs, the basics of verbal classrooms. I'm showing the intermediate levels of it. But if you want to see how I switch those pairs to make sure that the pairs are fresh and that they get to speak to all of their friends in the classroom, one of the most appealing aspects of verbal classrooms, uh, please go ahead and watch my, my other videos. 
but this is the basic switch practice that I uh, recommend to, uh, to everyone. From there, you can do different verbs like uh, I like, and then you would have to show the students that you have to um, insert the, uh, the auxiliary verb do, uh, do you like as part of the question. Put in subjects like I like cake, I like music, I like sports, and you're still cycling through all of those subjects. I like cake. Do you like cake? You like cake. Does he like cake? He likes cake. Does she like cake? She likes cake. Does it like cake? It's also a chance for them to practice that very difficult. Um, uh, to, it, to explain it is very easy. The third person singular requires the S sound be tagged onto the present uh, tense of the verb. I, you, we, they use the infinitive form, but he, she, it does. Uh, and that is something that they know, but to say it fluently, uh, instinctively, takes years of practice. It really does. And you'll notice it. They don't say things like, my father go to, I'm sorry, they don't say my father goes to work. They say things like my father go to work. But if they were able to say my father go to work as quickly as I just did, which is approximately 170 words per minute, they would be rated as fluent if they could hit some other targets with that. So even though I do teach the very, specific, the very basics of grammar, I don't harp on it. And I want to show you where uh, I, I go from there. Now we do things like, uh, I like cake, do you like cake? Uh, I go to uh, Hakata. Hakata is uh, one of the towns here in Fukuoka city. Uh, do you go to Hakata? I went to Hakata yesterday. Did you go to Hakata yesterday? And we start going to use that as the basis for independent conversations. And one of the first parts of independent conversations is to say more than just what I tell you to say. Up to now, I had been telling them, okay, well, let's say uh, I don't like tofu. Now everybody try, I like tofu. So it doesn't really matter what the student's preference is, whether they like it or they hate it. But from here, I want them to be able to start saying what they want to say. So we start with this. First, I tell them, just I and you. Only I and you, okay? No other subjects, no, no, nothing else besides I like cake, do you like cake? And you do that with your partner, okay? So it'll come out something like this. I like cake, do you like cake? 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 And they'll giggle a little bit because it's kind of goofy, but it um, gets even goofier in the next spot. Now, you can also use a, 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 an object like music. It doesn't really matter, but through this sequence, it would be the same. I'm just showing you, it doesn't really have to be cake. It can be, uh, I like cake, I like sports. Uh, I like cake, uh, it can be uh, turned into, I like, I, I like uh, spaghetti. It doesn't really matter, right? But you take that first answer and you repeat it. And it comes out to, I like music, I like music, do you like music? So the answer is said twice and the question is still only said once. And um, you don't have to explain to them because it's both a fluency uh, exercise and uh, a smoothness exercise in that sense. You're trying to say it smoothly, you don't want them stopping in the middle. Issues that I address uh, earlier in the other um, presentations that I did. And so they kind of titter at that and they're wondering, well, where do you go from here? Well, where do you go from here? This is where you go from here. Now you got to say it three times. And now they're wondering, why would you want us to practice saying that? We've already said it once. I tell them, number one, you can never practice anything too much. Just ask baseball players and ask them how much they practice hitting. Uh, they take batting practice two hours a day and that's even after they become professionals like uh, Suzuki Ichiro. But if you can learn to repeat, I want you to learn how to repeat for that moment when you think to yourself, I'm, I'm in a difficult communication situation and I want this person to understand. I want your first reflex to be to say exactly what you just said. If you say something once and the other person because of your pronunciation maybe, or maybe it's probably because your voice is too small, they make that face where they don't understand what you said, don't start backing up and telling yourself, oh, my pronunciation is bad, my grammar is bad, I need a different sentence. No, first, just learn to repeat it, say it again. I like music, I like music. That's communication. You're giving that person a second chance to hear it. So that's why I tell them learn to say it three times. I want you to learn how to repeat. Where do you go from there? Well, try saying it four times. 
And then you can set up a challenge where um, you teach them how to say it in, in different intonations. I like music. I like music. I like music with different emotions. I like music. I like music. Uh, because that's not something that they've done before. And then trying to teach them how to do that in this case with a very simple sentence that they've said before, maybe up to like dozens of times just in the fast, past few minutes, becomes the focus of what they want to do. When you're trying to show them an angry sentence and tell them, okay, say that in an angry way, they're struggling with two parts of a very large cognitive load. In this case, you tell them, take, I like music and say it in an angry way, then it becomes almost comical in their heads. You can also present them with physical challenges. Uh, and I do this by uh, telling them, okay, everyone pass a paper ball around in a circle while you're all trying to do this while you're looking at a, paper, a person's eyes. Okay, I gotta start going faster. I notice that I'm running out of uh, time. But they get to the point where they're able to say, I like music, I like music, I like music, I like music. Do you like music? I like music, I like music, I like music, I like music. Do you like music? Very, very quickly. Then I can set them up for the, um, oops, I gotta go back here. Uh, I can set them up for the next task. Oops, sorry, I gotta back up here. Where I tell them, okay, now you yourself, choose how many times you want to repeat that. So I remove the number and you can see that that's actually a question mark, which means as many times as you like, and you're going, what do you mean as many times as I like? I said, well, wait, I'm not finished explaining. I want you to repeat as many times as you like because you have a, a new task, okay? You're gonna take, I like music, you're gonna repeat it until you think to yourself, oh, I have another word that I can use to replace music. Whatever works grammatically, try to choose something that works grammatically. You know, I like music, I like music, I like music, I like skiing. That works grammatically. I like music, 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 I like cooking, I like cooking. That works grammatically too. I like books, uh, I like uh, ex Japan, uh, I like English, uh, I like uh, baseball, whatever. Once you've got that new word, remember that your partner doesn't know what you're about to say. So you have to make sure that's repeated. Now they really understand the value of repeating for communication because that room is very noisy. That first uh, those first few videos that I showed you where the room is always like a, in a full din, that's what it's like all the time in my classroom. So they are encouraged to repeat for the sake of the other student. Their instinct to say it once because they wanna get it over with, but I teach them to say it many times. Then the next task, put it into the question. So it would become, I like music, 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 I like soccer, I like soccer, I like soccer. Do you like soccer? That's the end of the first person's turn. Second person's turn will take that word soccer and then actually use it as their new repeat word. So they have to be paying attention to each other. The second person will then say, I like soccer, I like soccer. They're repeating. I like soccer, I like soccer, I like soccer, I like soccer. They're not allowed to stop. I like soccer, ah, I like soccer, I like soccer, I like so soccer, I like udon, I like udon, I like udon. Do you like udon? at all, at all, et cetera, et cetera, until I say stop. They then switch pairs, they do it again. And believe me, they don't find it boring. Um, you might think that they would, they never do. I can, I have, by the way, I will show you a YouTube playlist at the end of this, where you can see how the students react. And that entire video playlist was taken over a straight two hour affair. There were cuts in between, but it, it was a two hour demonstration class. So that's what I call the switch, and that is the basis of them to begin taking my structure control, my controlled structures, and start putting in their own uh, ideas and their own variables and eventually their own feelings. So we take that word like um, Netflix. I like Netflix. I like Netflix. I like Netflix. I like movies. I like movies. Do you like movies? Uh, you will see in this point that everyone has to say like. So if somebody says, I like uh, wakame, and you've got a kid who actually doesn't like wakame, they're forced to say, I like wakame. So I want to teach them how to go from the switch to do something called uh, the truth. And that begins with that little asterisk right there. That's at this point in the class, I mean, you'll see this in my other videos as well too. That is my designation for the negative form. So you put in the negative form. Now up to this point, I've been telling them that's the negative form. Everybody say the negative form and I will do it again here. And you can, you, I'm sorry, you have to do it in both the answer and in your new, uh, your new, um, um, your new, the, the sentence for your new word. Okay. But 
the new thing that I want them to do, okay, is to, make, to elongate that sentence, to make it longer. So what they have to do is not just say, I like Netflix, I like Netflix, I like soccer. I want them, which is what you see here. I want them to make that longer because one of the goals that I have is to get them to start saying sentences um, beyond three or four words at a time. If you count that, I like soccer and I like baseball, that's a seven word sentence. And most of these kids literally don't have the experience of saying seven words in a row without saying it from a piece of paper. This is the first step to their own feeling about the fact that, hey, wow, I said a relatively long sentence. Now, of course, to us as native speakers, that's not long. To them, it's very long. Uh, the research that I mentioned before, Robert Long, he is, his research pointed out that even with kids who are at about TOEIC 600, TOEIC 700, the measurement for how long you can go in a sentence without using a filler word like, you know, um, uh, or in Japanese, the equivalent of eh, to ano, uh, and stopping, using filler words, um, or um, uttering Japanese in the middle of an English sentence, is actually only about five syllables, not words, five syllables until they stop and then maybe they talk like this. You all know that I know that you know uh, that that's the way a lot of our kids speak. Now, of course, there are kids who speak better than that, of course, but the majority of our kids have that problem. And this tries to aim to give them a chance to practice something that's a, a little bit more smoother. So you take that and then you tell them, okay, remember how we practiced that in the negative before? Well, now, if you're going to be doing this in the negative, okay, and let's say you start with the negative uh, with I like, you tell them, okay, every place you start, I like, becomes I don't like, you can't say and anymore. Grammatically, you have to say, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's right. I, I, I wanted to show that um, if, if you're doing it all the way across as a negative, then you can still say and, okay? But if you're going to give them a choice, if you want to actually tell them, okay, well now tell me the truth. Do you like wakame or not? Actually, I don't like wakame. Okay, why well, don't you say I don't like wakame? Okay, what's the next word you're going to say? Oh, baseball. Okay, well, you like baseball, right? Yeah, I like baseball. Well, then your sentence will go. I don't like wakame. I don't like wakame. I don't like wakame. I don't like wakame. I like baseball. I, I don't like wakame, but I like baseball. Now, if the second word had been something they didn't like, it would have been and. And there's a whole series of uh, exercises to show them how to do that. Uh, and uh, that is what I would be showing if I had more time, but I realize now it's almost noon. Um, Wendy, I spoke to Simon and he said, he gave me the okay that I could go a little bit of time over past um, 1.15. So I'm probably gonna be going over past 1.15, little heads up for you in the audience uh, that I'm gonna need that extra time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like this on my blackboard. Okay, so those are the negative markers that I use. Um, I highlight in yellow where the new uh, variables are for where the kids should be watching and telling them that's where you potentially might end up stopping if you don't learn how, if you don't take to heart the methods that I'm teaching you, which I'm going to teach you one, and I have several of them, and teach you one that's very important shortly after this. I also teach them that um, over there on the left hand side where you see those plus minus markers. I start teaching them how to make that sentence even longer because if they like coffee very much, that's what the VM stands for, um, second from the top, then I'd just say, I like coffee very much. You know that feeling, you know that grammar, but I know what's hard for you is that you've never said it like that. Now, this thing that you, that, that you don't like, okay? You like coffee very much, but I don't like, or I hate milk. Maybe you do, I don't know. Maybe you're you know, lactose intolerance. I like coffee very much, but I don't like milk very much, but I hate milk. Now count those up. I don't like coffee very much, but I hate milk. That's a 10 word sentence. When was the last time a kid came up to you and said a 10 word sentence without reading it from a piece of paper or without flinching their eyes away or looking down? Well, that's what we're concentrating on in these, these exercises. Okay? And they're actually telling the truth. I hope they're telling the truth. And I do have to encourage them sometimes because they will sometimes take the easy way out and just say, I like, I don't like, 
And I keep encouraging them through demonstrations uh, and uh, through uh, complimenting a kid who actually uh, went out on the plank a little bit and tried to say a longer sentence to say these words. So look at that one. I, I like something, something a little bit. That gets even longer, right? So uh, another thing that you can do, by the way, is that um, you can put uh, these, uh, these possessive pronouns in there. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? That's referred to in my earlier videos as a double variable conjugation. A double variable conjugation is really hard for these kids because you have the single variable of the pronoun. I like cake. Do you like cake? I, you, he, she, it, we, they. But then if they have to juggle two variables, I, my, you, your, he, his, she, her, uh, and say that in a nice smooth tone like this, I have Netflix on my phone, do you have Netflix on your phone? You have Netflix on your phone, does he have Netflix on his phone? He has Netflix on his phone, does she have Netflix on her phone? Uh, most of the time when I do demonstrations uh, with people who have never done this before, it screws them up, they can't do it. It's, this is hard for native speakers, but I can get my kids to do this over time. And yes, I know it is not communicative. These are not real conversations. This is fluency practice leading up to independent conversations. So we're not quite at independent conversations yet, okay? And we're, we might not even be, depending on where you insert this next idea, which is outlined down here, it's called one idea, one breath. You might still be uh, in week five in my curriculum or maybe week six in my curriculum where you haven't really started to uh, show how to get to independent conversations yet, but you want to show them how to become fluent. Well, one of the tricks that I show uh, my kids is there are many things to becoming fluent, but one of the first things that you have to do is try to at least learn how to control your breathing, which for a lot of these kids actually is a, is a very familiar refrain from their judo instructors, from their shodo, believe it or not, shodo, breathing is very important, shodo instructors, from their cer tea ceremony instructors. I didn't know this, but in tea ceremony, learning to control your breathing is, uh, is a really important part of things. So learning to control your breathing on a sentence like, I have Netflix on my phone. What do I tell them? I implore them to think about it this way, okay? You have two variables. First of all, make sure that you know which ones you're going to use. If you don't know you're gonna use my, by the time you start, I have Netflix, you're going to eventually stop somewhere around on. But before you start that sentence, select your variables, even if they're wrong. Don't worry about the mistake, but at least select them. Then make sure you take a deep breath. Once you take a deep breath, aim to say all of these words that you have selected all the way to the end, to the period in that single breath. And it takes a lot of demonstration. This is, this is a very hard thing to do, but you tell them like this. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? And I do exaggerated demonstrations where I show them, you know, I'm having trouble with it. Sometimes if I think I need to, I show them almost about to stop, but still achieving the target of being able to become fluent. And that singular sentence can get longer and longer, okay? Because for example, you can do something like the negative, okay? I don't have Netflix on my phone. That answer gets longer. The sentence below with the question, that's actually uh, still about the same length, but it can get longer still, okay? I don't have Netflix on my phone, but I watch it at home. Now, trust me, your kids are gonna have problems with this. And how they have problems or how they progress will depend on your demonstration. And this is just one example. Um, I, uh, I tend to use as a warm up to my fluency exercises, the first 15 minutes of all of my fluency classes, a lot of shadow talking. And in that shadow talking, we use articles uh, from uh, Todd Buchan's incredible uh, ELLO site, ELLO.org, E-L-L-L-O.org, great site for um, listening and um, seeing uh, uh, natural English conversations. Uh, I admire it so much that I made my own website uh, to mimic it. But we use similar articles. And from there, I pick uh, a random sentence that looks like something I could use in my uh, uh, fluency exercises like this, and, uh, and I see the kids go for it. And building up to this one sentence can take like a good 20 minutes, 25 minutes of the class. You can keep going, okay? And um, I don't have Netflix on my phone, but I watch it at home. Do you have Netflix on your phone? And then you start making different variables, so then they don't get bored. Where do you watch Netflix? 
Then you have to explain the, uh, the question word where as a replacement for on my phone. And then they start practicing things like where, how, uh, what, when, depending on the answer above. Okay, uh, let's see here. This is one of the longest sentences that I've ever thrown at my students, but I think, you know, it's not rare for me to actually, um, uh, can you repeat that website? Oh, foreshadowing. Uh, I will repeat that website, uh, uh, Professor Kumagai, at the end of my classroom. It's e l l l three l's o dot o r g, and my website is uh, goldfish three six five dot com. Goldfish three six five, as it is on the bottom right hand corner of my uh, my slides there. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But there's one yeah, for you. Okay, was that you, Wendy? <laughs> No, okay. Uh, I like watching Blu-rays at home more than going to the cinema. How about you? So I, I let them have a bit of a break in the question because I want them to focus exclusively on that longer sentence at the top. Now, we go from there and we get back to that switching that I did, okay? Oops, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, I forgot to take out this. Uh, sorry, this is, a, this is embarrassing. This is a slide I should have removed. Uh, this, these were the things that I was thinking about doing. Okay. This is a, a mock-up of eventually how I want the Blackboard to look. Sorry about that previously. The Blackboard to look when I'm showing them how to take structures within which they have to work and the freedom that they have to actually insert their own variables. So the topic that you can see here is actually family, if you can see my cursor. Wendy, can you see my cursor? Um, no, I can't. Okay, so look up at the top. It begins, oh, it's, I have. It's, it's just very small. Okay, uh, I have at the top. And then second line from the top is, I like my family. So the topic is family. And from there, uh, they have uh, uh, an ability to switch the word and they're extending it from, I like, my fam I like my family, I like my family. And that's important to show them the my, your exercise before you get to this topic of family. Then they have to choose a different member of their family. I like my sister, I like my brother, I like my uncle, I like my aunt. Then they're asked to take a new grammatical structure. My sister is, my brothers are. And I asked them, tell me about your brothers. Are your brothers tall? Are your, brothers, are your brothers strong? Is your sister pretty? Is your sister smart? And we review the vocabulary for that. So to show them these are your choices, if you wanna say that. Is your father angry? Is your mother kind? And then they can choose that and start feeling like they're actually conveying to their partner an actual slice of their life because these are the words that they chose. Then they have the new challenge down here, which is, do you like your mother? Do you like your father? Which would be appropriate because that's the way we would ask that question in English. But if we're talking about sisters, brothers, uncles and aunts, you have to uh, afford them the ability to say, I have a sister in the answer, or do you have a sister in the question? Or I don't have a cousin, because a lot of these kids don't have cousins, uh, in, their, um, in, their, uh, in their answers. So now they're learning actually within these stru controlled structures to actually start thinking for themselves. At the same time, I'm still encouraging them to keep up their speed, to not stop during the sentence, which is a huge cognitive load. So it's starting to teach them, and uh, forgot about the uh, plus minuses there on the left-hand side, to actually speak with longer sentences while they're doing that. So it would start with something like this, okay? Uh, my family, oops, sorry, sorry, got to step back. I accidentally switched there. Uh, it would start with my family and with just the extended uh, sentence, then, okay, uh, you add in character, you add in uh, possessions, you add in other things that you know that you can bring in without them failing. That's something that I talk about in my, my other videos, the no fail, uh, um, no fail concept. You do not ask these kids that you are not absolutely sure that they think that they can't do. I know that was really convoluted. Let me try that again. You do not put them in a situation where they think they might fail, the no fail scenario. And you keep going with speed, repeating information. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Kathy is still here, but uh, thanks Kathy, that's very nice of you to say. And uh, then you bring in different topics, a topic that they like to talk about, especially first year students. They love to talk about their high school. 
Uh, they love to talk about how they were, they were head of the brass band or that they were a manager of the baseball club. Trust me, they love to talk about high school. And don't give them difficult topics. Uh, what will they most likely talk about if they, have, if they meet an American friend, if they make a Canadian friend on campus from, from, from uh, an, exchange, uh, an exchange student? They would talk about high school. They would talk about music. They would talk about sports. So give them those kinds of topics, all right? So those independent conversations then become uh, 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 the, a, a new challenge uh, comes when I teach them how to speak without questions. That's why I have that question symbol with a stroke through it. I tell them, remove those questions at the end because up to now, they've always ended with a question. I like my sister. Do you have a sister? Uh, I like my mother. Do you like my mother? Now take out that question and learn how to speak without a question, which they all become very dependent on to tell them that it's my turn to speak. And if you think about a, a good conversationalist, you don't really need to be told it's your turn to speak by being asked a question every time. As a matter of fact, I find it kind of annoying when most of my students or some of my conversation partners in Japan always think that they have to keep asking me a lot of questions. Most of my really good conversations are discussions. And I teach these kids how to take out that question, how to watch their partner, uh, their face when they're finished, how to project that idea that I'm finished. I'm not going to ask you a question, but I just had an idea. I had a joke to tell you. And um, let's see here. So the idea of no questions this is going to be the last thing that I wanted to talk about. OK. Uh, or sorry, no, it wasn't no question. Sorry, there was one more thing. It was um, the, what I call the word throw. Sorry, it wasn't no questions. My slides, I think I got you the old version of my slides, uh, is uh, to get up to group conversations. I have a practice called a word throw. And this is a very, uh, very simple, but very, very good uh, exercise that you can use even as a warm up. So you have your kids all set up in pairs. Go watch my other videos to show how to do that setup. And you tell them, okay, give me an English word any English word, I don't care, as long as it's an English word, say that word to me, and I'm going to very quickly say a word to you. Then you have to prepare another word for me, and I'm gonna say another word for you. It'll be word, 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 word. And that is actually almost as hard as actually speaking in full sentences, because you'll end up with something like this, okay? Fork, baseball, knife, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, shoes, uh, Christmas, uh, speaker, uh, uh, bag, that's hard to do, okay? Now, you take that and you make something called the phrase throw by asking them to say two words, any two words. The words themselves don't actually have to make sense. You can say something like blue dog, okay? Or diamond tree, if our kids know how to say diamond. Doesn't really matter as long as they're two English words, they're said very quickly to each other. You're just setting up that reflex for high speed responses and high speed ideas coming out of their heads. So they would say things like blue dog, diamond tree, uh, small knife, uh, bad teacher, hate English. That's fine, okay? Then you start giving them parameters, okay? And those parameters would be in the form of those two words, keep going with two words, but I want you from now on to choose one of those words as a verb. It can be the first one, it can be the second one, okay? It can be both of them, but at least one of them has to be a verb. Okay, so you would say things like, um, uh, I go, uh, jump, kick, uh, throw, baseball, is what these kids will be saying to each other, and they're going to be having a great time, because it's actually a lot of fun. I wish I could um, uh, show you more, but I knew that I'd be really pressed for time at this point. And you will, after a couple rounds of that, a couple rounds maybe will take, depending on how you feel, a one round is maybe between 30 seconds, 45 seconds, about a minute and a half of high intensity practice. You're gonna tell them, okay, did you notice that most of you guys were saying something like, sister, study, because you had this image of your sister always at her desk because she's getting ready to um, take her university entrance exams. Or maybe you were talking about yourself and you said, play baseball. Let me show you guys how close you are to actually saying full English sentences. If you took either one of these and you added one more word, the appropriate word that was missing, like sister study English, or in your case, you were talking about yourself, I play baseball. Do you realize that, that is what we, I told you would be the goal of this class that you guys would learn how to speak in subject, verb, object? Sister study English communicates to me exactly what you're thinking. 
oh yeah, my sister studies English or my sister studied English last night would be more precise, but I don't really care, okay? You actually took a huge step because you're not speaking with just single words anymore. Now you're speaking with the basic grammatical knowledge that you can now embellish with more accuracy as you get used to it. Then you tell them now from here, okay, I want you to do something. Oh, sorry, 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 I'm gonna step back. Phrase throw plus one um, becomes sentence throw. So you tell them now from now on, I want you to check before you speak, take your time. Do you have a subject? Do you have a verb? Do you have an object? And start throwing that with each other. Okay, I'm gonna start moving through my slides really, really quickly now because it is 1.15 and I wanted to have a chance to talk to you guys uh, and actually see your faces. So I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly. This is basically what I show the students to get them up to the 13th, 12th week when I start showing them how to do um, the, uh, the semester assessments. And the semester assessments themselves uh, consist of what it is that you can read up there. Basically, they take their environment that they've been practicing in, which is no paper, very little in terms of actual reading, that's all done in the shadow talking, and they start getting ready to have unrehearsed five minute English only conversations in front of me. The emphasis is not on their grammatical accuracy, not at all. It is on their ability to communicate a meaning in English only to a person's eyes in an unrehearsed conversation. So I tell them, listen, if you're making grammatical mistakes, don't worry about it because I'm not marking you on grammar. I'm marking you on things like, are you looking down when you talk? Are you still whispering your sentences? Are you guys not working as a team? Did you think you could uh, get away with memorizing an entire speech for me and that you thought that I would accept that as a conversation? Well, that's where you might fail. If you speak any Japanese, this is a huge cognitive load for these kids because they've never done uh, full on uh, non-Japanese conversations, five minutes. If you speak any Japanese, I'm gonna penalize you extensively. So that's the basic structure of the, um, of the, uh, of the conversations. And I asked them, start thinking, and as we go through these practice topics of what you could say, if I was to give you these sort of topics as your topics for your conversations, because the first conversation, they can choose the topic, the group can choose the topic. But out of these 10, there were two conversations, five minutes each, right? I get to choose the second topic. And I only tell them at the end of the first conversation. So it has to be an unrehearsed topic. Uh, I'm sorry, unrehearsed conversation. Uh, and, um, and they know that because they can't practice for all 10 of these. In the first semester, I give them the topic list on the left. In the second semester, I mix it up. I give them the topic list on the right. And this is what my semester assessment sheet looks like. You can see where their names are signed at the bottom so that then I can make sure that they were there. Uh, topic number one, they will come into the marking room or the assessment room with that filled in, and I'll fill in the assessment for topic number two at the bottom. You can see, and by the way, I will all, this is also available on my, on my main website. You can download this conversation test assessment form in, um, in pages format, so you can edit it yourself, um, that um, they are marked not at all on grammar or on vocabulary or textbook. What textbook? We don't use textbooks in my classes. And um, they're marked right in front of their eyes. I tell them their final uh, test grade right there. And that actually makes them pretty happy. They don't go home wondering what their test grade was. Um, the course that I designed works over two years, two semesters per year, 16 weeks per semester. So there's actually two years worth of exercises. I have only shown you, I've only ever had a chance to show anyone the first semester's worth of exercises. And I'm very sorry that I had to skip through it very quickly. But what I wanted to give you is the idea that um, my system works. And um, here's the assessment for when I do this uh, second year, when I'm having them work in either in adversarial or cooperative pairs, okay? And uh, I take the pairs and I make their own groups. And I've only shown you a very small part of things, but I also wanted to show you that for the people that have taken this up, none of them are here today. Uh, actually, Mary Uchida is going to be helping um, host uh, some of these session ESL, sessions, ELL sessions. So if you meet her, uh, tell her uh, I said hello. And um, other people like um, uh, Catherine and my good friend, Adam Jenkins, every time somebody starts picking this up from me, um, they say that it really worked far better than I thought it would. And I wanted to make this presentation like my other presentations, a chance for you to see the little work. And if you want me to help you 
I will make time to specifically talk to you and show you how to do it as I did with these other people. Okay, the uh, YouTube playlist uh, that I have uh, is there. These slides will go up on my website. So don't worry, you don't have to scramble to go get your phone to get that QR code. But um, I will return to this if you want me to, but it is up there. Uh, that is all of the YouTube videos that I made of me actually teaching a demo class, not a real class, a demo class. So it has its own little flaws that way. But uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, coming uh, to watch. And that's uh, pretty much it for the main part of the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Or Wendy, uh, I'll leave it up to uh, you to come in and tell me uh, what we want to do from here. Thank you very much, Jose. That was a very, I think, enlightening presentation about teaching fluency. Um, Addy, did you have a... Yeah, I was, I was, that's really interesting. Thanks, Jose. I really like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can see the application quite well in a lot of different things that people do. One question I got is, what sort of homework assignments would you set based upon that type of presentation? Okay, I hadn't been thinking about homework for a long time because um, remember, uh, somebody who originated this method, I had no one to discuss with to, to think about, well, what if I do this? Will it bog the kids down? So I was very, very conservative in my movement uh, from when I first started it up all the way to the end. And one of the things that I thought is that I could probably sell the idea that when you come to this class, and this is the truth, they are exhausted at the end of the 80 minutes, the 70 minutes, because they're flapping their gums all the way through it. Tell them, I know that you guys have a, you know, a, a, a lot of energy that you need to expand in my classes. So make a deal. I'm not gonna ask you to do any homework, but I want you to know you will have no time to check your phones. You will have no time to chit chat with each other in Japanese. You will have no time to sleep. You simply can't. You are moving all the time. You are talking all the time. I want to make you a trade, okay? You're not going to have any homework, but I want you full engines on, 100% effort in this all the time. Now, I noticed that that's not so necessary these last few years, and I've been doing a little bit of homework. So um, the vocabulary that they needed to actually do family, for example, I have Quizlet sets for that. The vocabulary that they need to explain um, what they do when they practice baseball. I have a Quizlet set for that. I then also encourage them to, um, to actually take those practices home by week six, week seven. It's burned into their heads. I go to you go, you go to he go, he goes to she go. And I tell them, optional, but do you really want to become a fluent English speaker? Let me tell you, you have to punch in this year 200 hours of speaking time. Where those 200 hours come from, I don't know. But trust me, if you think this is a good class, that's great. But that is only 80, maybe 70 minutes a week. Okay, That will not add up to 200 hours this year. Do the calculations, figure it out for yourself. Where are you going to do it? And speaking means things like reading aloud, um, singing English karaoke, uh, shadow talking your favorite Netflix show. Show them all these kinds of things. I hadn't up to now, but if you look at the things that we do in class, take that home, do it. That's what I do. Wendy, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Not at all. It happens to all of us, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that my uh, background has flipped. That's all right. So, uh, no, Michiko no, it's good. Is, it's good. Michiko is asking, uh, do you do, do any other things during the class, for example, writing? No, nope, it's fluency class. We don't do any writing. Uh, we don't really do reading per se. What we do is a variation on shadow talking, which is where I give them the actual print from my website or the uh, printout that I prepared from uh, Todd's website. So it's a little easier to put it all in an A4 sheet. And while they're shadow talking, they're looking at the words. And I remind them, this is not reading. You are not reading for comprehension. You are reading, so you're increasing your cognitive load, both in your listening and in your shadow talking while you're looking at words that you are saying. So you're increasing your cognitive load. You're not reading for comprehension. Um, people have asked me before, hey, Jose, how about if they actually write out what they want to say so that they're prepared? I tell them, no, they can do that at home if they really want to. But in this class, I want you to mimic what would happen if you went to a party at your exchange student's friend's house. Do you actually write down your sentences before you actually go talk to that guy who plays baseball just like you do, except he does it in Venezuela? No, you got to do it right there. Now get used to that feeling. And um, writing, they have plenty of other writing classes. They have plenty of other reading classes. Mine is probably the only pure speaking class that they have. 
So um, I encourage them to sort of think about it in that sense. Okay, so uh, Marianne is asking, do you have them do extensive individual speeches or monologues or all interaction? And I, uh, that's a great question because I actually do a combination of both. Now. In the second year, first, maybe a repeat of it in the third semester, if I have a particularly advanced class in the first year of uh, VC, we do something called, do you remember that word throw? So we go from word throw, then we go to phrase throw, then we go to sentence throw. Then I start telling them, hey, well done guys. Now do two sentences, sentence, 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 sentence. And I'm encouraging them to actually tell a story. Like, yeah, you're talking about your mom's cooking and he's talking about how he hates his math teacher, but you're staying on that theme all the way through, okay? Now take those two sentences, okay? And now I'm not gonna ask you how much you're gonna say, I'm just gonna time it. Every person is going to be asked to speak for 30 seconds. I'm gonna say, start, stop. Left-hand side, start, stop, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Most of these kids have never spoken English for 30 seconds at a time. I said, wow, fantastic, switch, let's do it again. Now you know where your problems were, okay? Maybe it was like you were trying to think about the right verb, I give you 10 seconds right now to maybe make some corrections to what you said. We done? Okay, ready? Do the same speech. It was a speech, you guys. Good speech. Do it again. New partner. Ready? Right hand side, go. Left hand side, go. Switch again. Okay, got a new challenge for you. 45 seconds. But you don't have to make a brand new speech. Take the 30 second speech, repeat that. So right now while I'm talking, try to remember what you said. Repeat that and you only have to tag on 15 seconds more new stuff. This isn't as hard as you might think it is. It's the same speech with more new stuff, 45 seconds. We do the same thing for 60 seconds. And I challenge you to go a minute and a half. And they're all exhausted at this point, but we're still going. Okay, let's stop at a minute and a half. Now, everyone, take that minute and a half. Everything that you said, remember it. Go through it. Make any changes that you want because you're going to have to crush it down into 45 seconds. You're going to have to speak twice as fast which is good because you guys were going uh, 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 half the time. Now you just have to remember all your sentence. Take that 90 seconds, 45 seconds. Take that 45 seconds, put it into 30. You've got a bang ass story to tell at the next party that you have to talk to that Venezuelan guy again about baseball. Mini speeches, monologues. Um, when that um, idea was first conceived, I didn't actually conceive that idea. Um, was first conceived by my other cohorts back in 1995, who did the pioneering work for uh, my method. Uh, they went all the way up to two minutes, four minutes, four minutes down to two, down to one, down to 30. And you can do any variation that you like, depending on how, and this is really important. I, for those of you who have not seen me talk about this before, you have to watch your student. You cannot look at your lesson plan and think, I got to finish this. And you don't have to that is a ball, around, ball and chain around our necks that we've had with the textbooks that we've been forced to teach. In this case, you're going to be much more like a baseball coach or, um, I don't know, like a, 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 an archer, some kind of physical instructor where you're watching your charges and you're looking, yeah, his elbow is a little too low. He's got a, and you tell him about the elbow, you tell him about the, you know, maybe take your pinky off the bat kind of thing. And you're watching them that day, maybe that day, literally. The day before, you're in Fukushima, and there was a huge earthquake in Fukushima. And these kids are worried about their dog because the dog had to spend the night at the vets, and they're not going to be speaking as fast. So you ease up on them a bit. Don't follow the textbook if you don't need to. I'm sorry. Well, I'm talking too much. Uh, Wendy, is there another question? Uh, no more questions in the chat. OK. Um, everyone, thank you very much for staying around. I will stay around if you uh, want, but uh, uh, I've only got another two minutes because I think somebody else has this room. So we probably really do have to say goodbye now. Wendy, are you hosting actually, the next one? Um, actually, there is now a lunch break time until 2.15. Oh, so well. it, it on our schedule, it says this room is closed, but I think it would probably be all right to keep it open. OK, I'll stay. Yeah. Yeah, whatever questions. And um, I don't know if people want to now that we can be a bit more casual about it. But okay, um, I'll just, how about Wendy, if I just make a quick goodbye, and then we can kill the recording? Or do you think we should keep up with the recording or what? No, I was just going to say, um, it's probably a good time to stop the recording as well. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, please visit goldfish365.com. 
uh, and you will find the section there for verbal classrooms. You'll find all of my slides, recordings of my other presentations and other documents that I put up uh, to help people learn this method. Please contact me at the, oh, I didn't uh, show this enough, but I will show it again. Please contact me if you like at this email address, jose at goldfish365.com. And I will, I will, I will, I will work with you and I will help you. And um, this method, a um, couple of the people that I showed you who gave me testimonials, uh, Mary, for one thing, she teaches at uni and at elementary school and with little kiddies, she does this with little kiddies. Uh, two of those people were junior high, school uh, junior high school teachers. One is a high school teacher and a uni teacher. And the other one, Adam Jenkins, he's a uni teacher. So this works everywhere. As long as you tell me what you need, I can tell you how to tailor. It. Okay. So thank you very much, Wendy. Why don't we uh, close it up there? Sounds good. Thanks again, Jose. I think it was a very informative talk.